joined by someone who's had an extremely interesting career. We take a look at life after the job. We talk highs, lows and lessons learned and what comes next on the outside. Now, my guest today has been a leading voice in raising the alarm about biological males in women's spaces. And for five years, she's worked with Fair Play for Women, a group that campaigns to protect the rights of women and girls in the UK. She led their sports campaign, meeting with UK and international sports federations in a bid to ensure that only biological females can compete in women's sport. Her work has become a, even more crucial in the recent years as the female category in many sports has continued to be opened up to biological males who identify as women. She continues to be a fierce advocate for female athletes, highlighting why sex segregation matters in sports in her current role as director of campaigns at Sex Matters. I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Fiona McEnena. Fiona, welcome. Well, that was a big old intro. So talk me through um, why you got involved in this particular era, why, why you ended up being involved in campaigning for women's spaces. Well, I'm sort of an accidental campaigner. Mm. I think a lot of us are. Uh, because when the government was trying to change the Gender Recognition Act in 2018 to be self-ID, meaning that anyone could just request that they change their birth certificate from male to female or mm. female to male, I started to see some problems with that. And then I, I started, to, once I was aware, I started seeing it everywhere. I started hearing about things that were happening in sport, uh, in prisons. Mm. You might remember there were stories of women being sexually assaulted and even raped in women's prisons by men who were in there claiming to be women. Um, now, many people may genuinely feel that, but if there's one person I wouldn't trust, it's a convicted rapist, mm. you know, when he says he feels like a woman and he's entitled to be in a women's prison. So in 2018, all of that started to be um, kind of in the media a little bit. Um, it's kind of gone off the media after mm. that. The media, I think, got a bit nervous, but by then a number of us had started to realise we had to push back. And uh, I was working with Fair Play for Women, who mobilised the response to the Gender Recognition Act. Um, we got that stopped, but, mm. you know, there are so many areas still where people simply seem to feel they have to accept that if a man says he now feels like a woman and wants to be treated as a woman, that he, he has the right to have that. And Sex Matters, the group I'm with now, we simply say everyone's human rights matter, that person's rights matter, but mm. so do mine, so do yours. And there are some times when we can't pretend that a man's a woman. Sport is a big one of those, but there are others. And so now that's the, that's the work that I focus on. Because, mm, of course, today is Trans Visibility Day. <laughs> and uh, we were talking about Leah Thomas. Now, this is uh, it, it's obviously something that's happening in America, where this is uh, clearly a man. He's in women's sports. But as you rightly pointed out earlier, that it's not just the sport itself where it's unfair for women. It's actually all the things around it as well. Yeah, so Leah Thomas was very high profile mm. because he was a very average swimmer and suddenly he was a national champion in America because uh, of competing in a women's event. We had our own sort of Leah Thomas moment here with a cyclist called Emily Bridges who'd been a, a male champion in, in Britain and then wanted to be in the women's team. Mm. But the, the area that, that I uh, really focus on now is, is that at all levels of sport here in the UK, we are hearing from women and girls who are being forced out because they can no longer be confident of fair or safe sport. And, you know, it's not just on the playing field. It's if, you, um, if you're going to go into the changing room and you can't be sure there isn't going to be a male in there, for some women, that's enough to drive them away. You know, that no one should have to explain why she wants privacy from the other sex, but, but we do hear from women. It can be their religion, it can be some trauma in their childhood, it can be teenage girls can be very self-conscious. There are so many reasons. And so a measure that sports call inclusive, which is letting males who identify as women into women's categories, we're finding is actually excluding women and girls because they're driven out of sport, they lose their place, they're afraid of being injured on a football field, and they just don't want the discomfort of having to share changing rooms with, with men. Mm. Well, I don't understand why this has become a thing, because to me it's quite clear that if a man is a man, a woman is a woman, if a man wants to identify as a woman, the first thing I would ask is, what is a woman? <laughs> because it doesn't feel to me that they can ever answer that. What is a woman then? Is it some people say it's a feeling? It's a this is that. 
No, it's not. It's a biological reality. Otherwise, what is a woman? Yeah, well, that is a big question. And I'd also say, what's a man? Mm. And the fundamental truth is the reason we have a separate category mm. in sports and in many other places like prisons is because male and female bodies are so different. You know, female bodies can do amazing things. You mm. know, we can gestate and give birth to a baby. But because we're geared up for that, even if we never do it, our bodies are different from male bodies and we just cannot produce the same power, the same speed. You know, a, a, if you put a man and a woman of similar size and age together, he can punch more than twice as hard mm. as she can. So that's why we separate male and female in, in so many walks of life. Well, why do you think so many... Because this isn't just um, men who are enabling this. This is, there are many women who enable this as well. And I don't understand why they can't see why the separation is there. Yeah, I think that you're right. When people say, oh, men made these decisions about sport, mm. it's women too. Mm. I've seen that. I think there are a couple of reasons. One is that there's huge pressure on women to be kind and to be accommodating. Um, you know, people will say, well, there aren't that many trans women, as they'll call them, meaning males who identify as women. There aren't that many. Why can't you just include them? And what they're really saying is... Those people matter more than you do. Their feelings matter more than fairness for you. So I think there's huge pressure mm. on women and we're socialized to be accommodating. Um, I also hear women saying, well, you know, we're just as good as men, we can cope. And of course, <laughs> we may be just as good, but we're different. Mm. So there, we still need separate categories. Um, it, so it's been quite a battle to try and reestablish the right of women to have what men have which are, is fairness. Are we making headway with this? Because it feels like we move forward and then there's some other ridiculous case of a man who then says he's a woman and then everyone's going along with it and you're like, it's just not, the man is not a woman. Uh -huh. like, except he can be, you can be a trans, I mean, I, I, some people actually object to a trans uh, woman being called a trans woman and, and actually it should be a trans man if they're a man identifying as a woman or a trans person. Well, people are very confused. You're, you're quite right. People are very confused by the language. And this is another battle on this front. It's why language matters. Because if, if I can't sit here and say that person is male, he has a male body, and that's why he doesn't belong in women's sport or a women's swimming session or women's changing room, if I can't use those words, man and male, we can't have the conversation. And that's one of the pressures, of course, that we're under is not to say those things. Mm. People say that's really unkind. Why do you have to be so mean? I don't want to be mean, but I'm entitled to express that view and I need to be able to say it to protect women and girls. And I say to those people, why are you unkind to women and girls? Why don't you care about them? You know, this isn't just competitive sport. It's also um, women and girls wanting to um, go swimming, mm. go to female only gym sessions. And if they can't be sure that that's what they're going to find, some of them are just dropping out and that is unkind that's not inclusive should women decide then so i think it was i think it might have been a swimming event or it was at darts it was darts actually where the women refused to compete do you think that is the way forward when women say well we're not going to compete yeah that's been happening a bit it's been happening in pool as well where there's a legal case going on um I think it's really asking a lot of women to give up their own opportunities mm. just to make a point. They shouldn't have to. It shouldn't come to that. I think any woman or girl should be free to say, I'm not going to do that. It takes courage. They risk really some quite nasty criticism, but often they find that they also, also get a lot of support. But I don't think we should be expecting women to boycott their own category in order to restore fair rules. It's really up to policymakers and decision makers. And I'd like to see the government step up and say, come on. You know, the reason we have a female category is for the people who otherwise would have no chance of winning things because male and female bodies are so different. So no men in that category. It doesn't matter how they identify. Mm. Let's accommodate them in an open category. There are solutions. The big sports, you ask where we are with this now, mm. The big sports in the world, the biggest Olympic sports, which are athletics, cycling and swimming, they've all recognised this and they've restored fairness. And because they've done that at world level, the UK federations have done that too. Um, but we're still waiting on an awful lot of other sports. Just, this is absurd, really, to me. It's so, so, it's so straightforward. I'm confused as to why it's become a, a, an issue and a confusion and why it's become some sort of insult that when you call a man a man, I mean, of course, we had India Willoughby being upset when she was called a man because she is a man, not, not, not to be horrible to her, but biologically she is a man. So even though I'm, I, you know, I'm honouring the, the fact that I'm calling her a she, mm. but ultimately I'm being forced to go along with something 
that I don't necessarily agree with. Not that she's trans, I disagree with that. Mm -hmm. But I disagree with having to lie to my own eyes about what somebody is. Yes. And when we talk about sports or prisons Mm. or refuges, we say it's not because you're trans, it's because you're male Mm. that you do not belong in the category or the place that was designated for females. Mm. And it's not an insult to be male. No. It's, it's just a fact. Um, but I, but I, I think that when there is a high-profile case, like, you know, the Leah Thomas or the Emily Bridges, those sports tend to realise that they can't get away with it because it's making them look bad. And I, I rather fear that we're going to have to see that in a few other sports wow. before we get some sense. And I want to mention the boat race to you mm. because I know you yeah. featured it yesterday. Mm. So British rowing here in the UK has re-established that the female category is only for women and girls and there's an open category for everyone else. Mm. Great. For everyone, in fact. That is not the case at world level. So those women we saw racing yesterday on, on, the, on the Thames, um, some of whom will represent Great Britain and, and one of whom has represented the US, um, they could, when they go and compete internationally, they could end up facing crews from other countries that have a male rower in there. Um, and, you know, that means they're going, that male is 10% stronger on average than an equally competent, mm. equally fit, equally skilled woman. Uh, And in fact, in America, the U.S. rowing team accepts men who say they're women in its women's team. It's just ridiculous. And I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, look, I respect whatever you choose to identify as, but I don't think people should be forced to agree that that is what you are when the biological reality says something different. It is it is very odd. I don't understand why we're going in this direction. Very briefly, uh, what are your thoughts? And are you concerned about a Labour government coming in? Because they seem a lot more uh, giving to this whole debate of self-ID. But they say the self-ID thing's gone away, mm. so let's wait and see. But what I'm describing in sport is, is another form of self-ID. These mm. people don't have a birth certificate saying they're female, um, but they still have rules that say they're allowed in. So I'm very... We want to see the Labour government follow the guidance that the sports councils in the UK have given, which is to say it isn't fair and you really should be thinking about what fair rules are. And they need to find a bit of courage. Mm-hmm. These but governing bodies. So if people want to find out about sex matters, is there somewhere they can... Yeah, they can, they can follow us on X at, at sexmatters.org or they can go to sex-matters.org, our website. Thank you so much, Fiona. Really good to talk to you. Thanks. That is Fiona McEnina. She's the director of campaigns at Sex Matters.